some of you might have seen as you came in through the door that uh, today all the dana, all the donations that are being offered to IMC or offered here will go to the American Red Cross for uh, disaster relief because of all the fires in uh, California. It's a huge thing, these fires, and you know it's astounding the number of homes that have been burnt and the number of people displaced and the whole town destroyed. And, uh, but not just up in Paradise, Northern California, but also in Southern California, and coming in the heels of one of the biggest fires in the, in the state just a few months ago, and bigger ones last year, two years ago. It's, it's just quite astounding. And uh, so here we sit in this uh, world. The Buddha once said, the world is burning. And not only is California burning, but uh, we're, we're, we're breathing in the smoke. And who knows what's in that smoke? It isn't just, you know, wood burning. It's plastic and chemicals of every kind. And uh, in the ways in which, you know, our society has produce so much uh, material that is polluting it and uh, health hazards comes through the smoke for us now. And so it's kind of poignant, very poignant to have the smoke and be able to see it and smell it and breathe it. And what is this world we've created? And the fire that uh, we see in California, many people are saying is partly due to climate change, that the temperatures are h higher and drier. And uh, so it's they say, some people say, it's a human cause, the climate change, it's likely. And, um, and then, uh, you know, there's this, well, I thought I was kind of amazed by the news last week of, of these, and I guess, nanoplastics that are now spreading out throughout the waters and lands and everywhere. And, um, and uh, something as innocent as uh, washing your synthetic clothes sheds a little bit of these nanoplastics into the sewage and into the bay and into, you know, and so it goes around and around and we're building, you know, this wonderful reservoir, terrible reservoir of nanoplastics. And uh, they say that apparently it's very hard to get salt now, table salt, that doesn't have this nanoplastic in it because it's just everywhere going on. So what is this world we're living in? And then we have shootings in Thousand Oaks and we have shootings in Pittsburgh and in Louisville. And uh, it seems like it just comes one after the other. I felt, uh, felt very kind of, felt very deeply for people in Thousand Oaks. So I lived there for a short while growing up, but uh, it was um, some of the people who experienced the shooting then experienced the fire down there. And uh, you know, what's, what's it all coming to? Just, you know, just on and on. Some of the people were, part of the Las Vegas shooting some time ago. So it's astounding. Some of you probably know people who were from Pittsburgh or know people who were there in that area. I do. People, maybe you know some people in Thousand Oaks. You know some people up in, maybe up in the Chico area and Malibu area and different places where it's going on. So here we are in this world. And, um, and then we have our practice. And we have uh, this wonderful practice that on the surface looks like it's about going inwards and becoming quiet and still and calm. And it'd be very easy to uh, assume and perhaps actually experience this as something that's removed from the world around us and has nothing to do with it and pull in, escape and come here. Uh, discover some kind of enlightenment and uh, it's not just listeners to uh, Dharma talks who hope to be enlightened, speakers of them too. There's a story of people getting enlightened in their own Dharma talks. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and so this, uh, you know, the world of practice and the world of the world, uh, there's, uh, for me, it kind of symbolically represented by two images, one from ja Japanese, uh, Japanese culture, Japanese Buddhism. Um, uh, the moon in the dewdrop. The dewdrop represents in Japanese culture something very ephemeral. The dewdrop is just there very briefly until the sun comes out when it evaporates. And the moonlight, the moon represents enlightenment, the enlightened mind, the, f the perfection of this world in some way. And to see in the dewdrop a reflection of awakening and freedom is something that's very, very poignant in Japanese culture. And so you find lots of references in Japanese culture to the moon and the dewdrop. 
um, one of the ones that's very poignant in the topic of today, there's a, uh, a Japanese poet named Isa, and he doesn't evoke the moon, but he evokes the dewdrop. Uh, uh, it's a very simple, and it's the how it ends that's quite powerful. Um, the world of dew is the world of dew. And yet, and yet. And the world of dew is this ephemeral world that we become enlightened in. This, the, the, each, each little dew drop is like a jewel in itself. And everything's a jewel. Everything's ephemeral. That's just kind of one of the perspectives of Buddhism. But Isa lost his mother when he was two or three, lost his f three wives, lost four children through his lifetime. And, uh, and so this idea of looking into the world, a dewdrop, the world as a dewdrop, the moon and the moon and the dewdrop, he had some sense of that, but then, but, but, <laughs> this world of pain that he's experienced. He had another poem. Um, everything I touch with tenderness. It's a nice talk, nice. Everything I touch with tenderness. This idea of being tender in the world. But it goes this way. Everything I touch with tenderness, alas, pricks like a bramble. Everything that I love has thorns in it somehow. And, um, you know, he, so, many, so many losses he's had. So what is this world we live in? And how do we live in this world of fires everywhere? And, uh, and how do we relate this practice to this world that we live in? That's kind of what I'd like to talk about today. This idea of the world burning, I said the Buddha said this once. And... Um, the Buddha said, um, all is burning. And what is the all that is burning? Eye is burning. Forms are burning. Eye consciousness is burning. Eye contact is burning. And ever, whatever feeling arises with eye contact as a condition, whether pleasant or painful, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, with the fire of hatred with a fire of delusion, burning with lust, hatred, and delusion. I think the fire that burns in some of us, uh, with the fires in California and the shootings and everything, maybe are fires of fear and dismay and discouragement and overwhelm. There's many huge impact for people that these things have. And then, so how do we, how do we meet that? How do we respond to that? How do we work with the impact these things have. How do we respond to this world that we live in? And I want to read um, a, a little sutta, a little t uh, discourse that I've been wanting to read for years. I couldn't quite figure out when to do it. So hopefully today's the day. So uh, the Buddha is visiting um, a king named Pasenadi, who they were friends, they same age, they knew each other for decades. And um, so he was, uh, they were sitting together talking. And, um, or, or, or the, the, the king comes to him, comes to the Buddha, they sit down, and the, the, and the Buddha asks the king, um, where are you coming from now in the middle of the day? What have you been up to? And the king says this, just now I have been engaged in those affairs of kingship typical for kings who are intoxicated with the intoxication of sovereignty, who are obsessed with greed for sensual pleasures, who have attained stable control over the country, and who rule having conquered a great sphere of, ter of territory. He's a busy guy, <laughs> obsessed with his power, obsessed with his sensual pleasures, all the that he gets. That's a kind of pretty upfront guy. but. I, think I kind of love this little that he said to describe himself this way. So the Buddha responds to him, What do you think, great king? A person would come to you from the east, 
one who is trust, trustworthy and reliable. Having approached, the person would tell you, for sure, great king, you should know this. I am coming from the east, and there I saw a great mountain high as the clouds coming this way, crushing everything in its way. Do whatever you think should be done, great king. Then a second man, second person came from the west and said the same thing. It's a huge mountain coming this way, crushing everything in its way. Someone came from the south, from the north, and they all said the same thing. From all directions are coming towards, towards you. Huge mountains crushing everything in its way. It's coming here. Do what you want. Do what you think you should do, they say to him. Um, and so then the Buddha continues. If, great king, such a great per peril should arise, such a terrible destruction of life, uh, what should be done? So that's the scenario, the thought experiment. If, you know, you're going to, you're, everything's coming your way to crush you. There's nothing, out, no, you can't get out of the way. What do you do? That's the koan, that's the question. And so the king answers, if such a great per peril, peril should arise, such a terrible destruction, what else should be done but to live by the Dharma? What else should be done but live by the Dharma? And then the Buddha goes on to say that, uh, that the mountains coming inevitably will come is sickness, old age, and death. They're coming in from all directions. You're not going to get away from them. And with that per peril coming your way, what's the best thing to do? And he says, practice the Dharma. Why? Isn't it better to go out there and push the mountains back? Stop, stop sickness, old age, and death? What are we here in this world to do when we're up against and we're facing this such, such great peril. Sooner or later, we're all going to face this. I spent a lot of my Dharma practice, especially when I was doing long retreats like in Asia, as part of it, kind of looking death right in the eye. Kind of looking, kind of, kind of imagined when I was sitting and meditating that I was sitting with death right in front of me, this great, it was kind of like, for me, a great black, endless, expanse. And uh, that was there informing me, telling me, here, this is something you have to deal with. This is something, this is a context of your practice. What does it mean to face that, to be with it? What does it mean to practice a Dharma in that situation? What does it mean to rely on the Dharma, not before the mountains come? Maybe we think they're coming, they're, they're going to be a long time before they come. But what, what does it mean to meet to uh, to practice a dharma as a response to the fires in California and the shootings in the country and the racism in the country and um, you know uh, the environmental greater and greater environmental, cha environmental challenges we think we're going to come? What does it mean to practice with that? For me, uh, we practice in the domain of our consciousness, of what we are aware of. And we have this amazing awareness, consciousness, is this amazing meeting place of the vast world outside of us with the vast world inside of, inside of us. And there's a vast world outside of us that we know something about, about but not much. We know enough if we use our imagination to know that the fires in California, the shootings in Thousand Oaks, are just kind of a tip of an iceberg of people who are burning and suffering uh, challenges all over the world to a huge degree. The scale of suffering is huge in this world. And the scale of beauty and scale of love is great. But it's a lot. And then within us, there's huge dimensions, unseen dimensions within us. We can't know everything that goes on 
in our minds and hearts and our psyche. We're not constructed to know it all, to see it all and be aware of it. But we certainly can know that we're, if we're in distress, we can know if there's sadness, if we're heavy, we can know if we're afraid, we can know, uh, you know, if we're at, at peace or free, we can know something, something. But we, I, it's, I think it's useful to think we don't know everything that's within us. We don't know everything's around us. But the meeting of these two large unknown worlds is a domain of consciousness, the place where we're aware. And we don't. And in, in mindfulness practice and dharma practice, we bring a heightened attention, awareness, to that meeting place, that place where these two worlds come together, the place of consciousness. And we do it in such a way that we allow all these places, the outer world and the inner world, to inform themselves, to come together and coexist in such a way that this wonderful Dharma process that we are has a chance to unfold and deepen. And a way to do this is to take everything that occurs to you, everything that you're aware of in this little sliver of consciousness, and fold it back into your body. Bring it in and feel it fully. We have the ability to be consciously aware of our physical life, our embodied life. The tensions and softness, the tenderness, the hardness, the, um, the movements, the energies, the feelings that exist in the body. The royal road to the unconscious is through the body. To come back and feel the body and let the inner life process what goes on. It, it, you, you, you can allow that if you compost everything back into the body. Bring everything here. So whatever is happening in the world around you, the world inside of you, feel it in your body. Learn to be present in this sliver of consciousness that we have, in this little layer of consciousness that we have. Learn to really be there for it. Don't slide off it if you want to do Dharma practice. Don't slide off it into the thoughts, the stories you have, the imaginary concerns and fears you have. You'll have those. But learn the art of taking your reactions and responses and keep turning it back in to conscious awareness of how the body's feeling that. So if you're feeling afraid, what does that feel like in your body? And hang out there in your body to really feel it. If you're feeling uh, joyful, feel it in the body. What's it like there in the body? If the world around you is impacting you in an important way, feel it in your body. Come here, feel it here. Because that allows some kind of inner movement, process, healing, uh, reconciliation uh, to occur. It's a phenomenal to me how much we can trust mindfulness, mindfulness of the body, that allows some deep inner process to unfold that we could never engineer ourselves. And if we spend all our time thinking about solutions, thinking about how to react and how to respond and what has to happen, um, we're going to miss the opportunity for this deeper Dharma body we have to unfold, to resolve itself and find out what's here. Thinking is important. And thinking about things sh you know, should be done. But the art of it is to allow yourself to think but fold it in as quickly as you can back into your body. What does it feel like what you're thinking? What's happening in your body? What's happening in your emotional body? What's really going on here? And making room in the body for what's here to show itself, to unfold. Be quiet. Part of the reason to be quiet in meditation, to quiet the mind, is to make lots of room in awareness for some deeper pro embodied process to unfold. If we're, our awareness is filled with our thoughts, there's no room for other things to happen in this sliver of attention that we have. So we let the mind, the thinking mind become quiet so we can see or feel more space for what's happening deeper inside of us, what's happening emotionally, what's happening uh, deeper in the structures of the mind, what the impulses are, what, the, what's the, uh, what propels the mind to think. What's the attachments and clinging and worries and concerns? Nothing in Dharma practice 
can be, that needs to be seen as wrong if it just keeps getting composted back in. I find it phenomenal, this meditation posture, um, anybody's meditation posture, uh, if you really trust it and learn to feel some degree of at home in it, and then to fold everything into it, let it hold everything as if everything has permission to be there. Nothing is wrong. And then, uh, but then allow the inner process to unfold. You don't have to be worried or uh, alarmed at what goes on there. You just have to feel it. Digest it in the body. Compost it in the body. Uh, let it evolve in the body. Here, just sit. It takes, it takes time. It's a beautiful thing to have a meditation practice like this. It's a profound thing. And to rely on it by going into it often to frequently kind of trust it and come in and let it be the place where life is processed, where something evolves and develops. So there's a number of things that can happen when this, happen, when this goes on. One is the system that we have, the psychophysical system, uh, wants to release, wants to let go of the places of contraction. And it's when, when contractions and tightness, attachments begin to soften and release, it begins to change the whole inner landscape. And it begins to change the eyes through which we see the world. But if we don't do go through the transformation process, then we'll see the world through our usual eyes. And if our eyes is to see the world of peril, we'll see the world as dangerous. If we see the world through, uh, through our hate, we'll see hate. If we see the world through our greed, We'll see a place of greed. If we can let go of that and release that, we'll have different eyes. And what eyes you'll have when you let go of your holding, I don't want to tell you. Well, I want to, I want to, I'd like to know what happens to you. But to open up something deeper and deeper, what's here? And there's two things I'd like to emphasize that uh, can be important. Sometimes what we discover is a strong sense of inner power, of strength. Rather than kind of this self becoming self-effacing in the deeper peace, there's a kind of, almost like we become bigger because there's nothing in the way, nothing holding the energies back. And the inner strength. And this is represented in the Buddhist tradition by a wonderful uh, series of dreamlike uh, images that the Buddha gave, talks about, where he uh, keeps talking about letting go, letting go. Everything that comes up, you let go, let go, he says. But that when you get to the end of letting go, the final thing you come to, he says, you don't let go. And deep inside, when you let go enough, he says what you find in this kind of symbolic language he was using, this, this teaching, is you find a naga. And a naga in, you're smiling, cobra. a cobra for you, a cobra. And is cobra kind of sweet and weak? <laughs> what? It purges all the unwanted stuff. Purges all the unwanted stuff. So the, this thing of a cobra, a very powerful serpent, it means a variety of things in ancient India. Sometimes in the Buddhist text, a naga also means a big elephant. I don't quite know, is that right? So I think they're very powerful and big. And someone who becomes fully enlightened is said to become a naga. So that's nice. <laughs> you know, watch out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a certain kind of power that's there. And why not? So this idea, so there's a lot of emphasis in Buddhism on becoming peaceful, letting go, uh, being kind of loving and all these things, which are very profound. I don't want to dismiss the importance, but that can come, come along with a real sense of personal power and strength. So that's one thing that can happen. If we kind of fold everything back in the body, feel it in the body, be here, trust it, let it emerge, make room for what wants to emerge to show itself and be there. Sitting meditation like this, it's a, such a good place to let that happen because you're not going to make any mistakes sitting still. You're not going to. You're, you're committed to being silent in meditation. You're not going to say something, and you're not going to move. You're not going to hit something. <laughs> it's 
So this idea of exploring and discovering and letting what's there unfold to discover freedom and see what emerges in that is a great thing. And then there's something else that can happen. And, uh, and for this, I'd like to read you a Facebook post. That, I, that, I, don't, that I, I, I came across in the news. So we had the shooting. Some 11 people died at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. And the shooter survived, but was wounded. And he was taken to the hospital. He went to the emergency room or the trauma center there. And he was treated by a nurse who happened to be Jewish. And at first, he was, you know, the, the, the news uh, kept all the different news stations, apparently called them the Jewish nurse. And after a while, he saw that he's being referred to this all over without a name, and he didn't feel good about that. He felt he had to speak up and for himself, have his, have his own voice be spoken. So then he made this Facebook post. And that's, uh, the title of it is, I am the Jewish nurse. Yes. That Jewish nurse, the same one that people are talking about in the Pittsburgh shooting that left 11 dead. The trauma nurse in the ER that cared for Robert Bowers, who yelled, death to all Jews, as he was wheeled into the hospital. The Jewish nurse who ran into a room to save his life. To be honest, I'm nervous about sharing this. I just know I feel alone right now. And the irony of the world talking about me doesn't seem fair without the chance to speak for myself. To be honest, I didn't see evil when I looked into Robert Bauer's eyes. I saw something else. I can't go into details of our interactions because of HIPAA. I can tell you the, rule, the law, the rules for non-disclosure that medical people have to do, confidentiality. I can tell you that as his nurse, or anyone's nurse, my care is given through kindness, my actions are measured with empathy, and regardless of the person you may be, when you're not in my care, each breath you take is more beautiful than the last when you're lying on my stretcher. This was the same Robert Bowers that just committed mass homicide. The Robert Bowers who instilled panic in my heart, worrying my parents were two of his 11 victims less than an hour before his arrival. I'm sure he had no idea I was Jewish. Why thank a Jewish nurse when 15 minutes beforehand you'd shoot me in the head with no remorse? I didn't say a word to him about my religion. I chose not to say anything to him the entire time. I wanted him to feel compassion. I chose to show my empathy. I felt that the best way to honor his victims was for a Jew to prove him wrong. Besides, if he finds out I'm Jewish, does it really matter? The better question is, what does it mean to you? Love. Love, that's what I did it. That's why I did it. Love as an action is more powerful than words, and love in the face of evil gives others hope. It demonstrates humanity. It reaffirms why we're all here. The meaning of life is to give meaning to life, and love is the ultimate force that connects all living beings. I could care less about Robert Bowers. I, I could care less what Robert Bowers thinks but you, the person reading this, love is the only message I wish to instill in you. If my actions mean anything, love means everything. By Ari Mahler. So this process, when peril comes from all directions, what do we do? For Buddhists, it's a practice the Dharma. But to practice a dharma and bring everything in and compost it and digest it and unfold it and mature it is to touch a place of power, of strength, and a place of love, compassion. And to have those things two come together 
is a wonderful thing because it means that then we will do something. We will act. It's very hard to deal with all these difficult things happening in the world if we feel helpless. If we feel it's chaos and we have no control and we're being overwhelmed by it. It's very hard to manage with that. But to compost it all inside, to have some, you have something to do with it. You have a practice that's so powerful. Really, do, this is a time to rely on practice. When the peril is greatest, that's when the practice has the most value. And then do something, however small. Even the smallest thing you do will help be an antidote to feeling helpless. Exercise your capacity of compassion, of love, of care, of support, of your neighbors, your friends, your family, wherever you can, the world around you. Love grows, compassion grows, freedom grows by exercising it, by doing it and living it. If the world you want to live in or say it differently, you know, if you don't like the world you're living in, make it different. Make it different starting from you. Let it radiate out from you. To not do that, to be overwhelmed and reactive and think and treat it out there, is that so terrible and it's too much for me, is to forfeit this beautiful capacity we have of practice, of consciousness, of of digesting, of compost, of evolving and growing. We have an amazing ability here to create a new world that radiates from us. It's a waste of time to be reactive to a world out there as if it is overwhelming you. If it's, it's doing, so you're the victim of it. It's not really helpful. So for whatever degree you do feel like a victim, great. Compost it. Feel it in your body. Turn it back in. It won't survive. Sometimes it'll feel like when you bring everything back into the body, you'll feel like everything's burning. A different fire, the Dharma fire. Put everything in the Dharma fire. Let everything burn in the practice of attention, of mindfulness, the fire of mindfulness. Let it transform in the fire. Because in in our hearts, as all the kind of, everything burns off, what is left will be profound capacity for peace, profound capacity for tenderness, profound strength and compassion. Exercise it. Give it voice. Put it in action. Even if you feel just a smidgen of it, don't let it go to waste because then the alchemy, the, the growth and develop of it, the expression of it is what lets something deeper keep unfolding, keep growing. So we have fires in California. The world's on fire. And we could go about our life and breathe this air and just feel dismayed and discouraged and all that. Or we can do something to make a difference. And here at IMC today, we have the donation box available for the American Red Cross. It's not everyone's favorite place to donate, but in investigating and looking around at the options, I decided it was the best option. They do fantastic work. And they're right there meeting these kinds of crises and supporting people. And this is a time we want to support and help the people who are so distressed. So people who have, you know, 5,000 homes have been burnt up there in paradise. How many people live in those homes and how much has been lost in that process? So this is a time for us as a community to really, you know, let the Naga in us come forth to support this world. So, 
the world. So this, this is playing off this idea of a dewdrop. The world in a teardrop moistens the heart, quenching the fire. So don't be afraid of your tears. Fold it back in. It'll moisten your heart and quench your fires. Okay, so thank you.